What is the optimal amount of protein if you're trying to make them gains, bruh? And will it give you cancer? I've got a lovely friend along who's going to tell us all about it. Dr. Matthew Nagra, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the channel today. I'm a massive fan of your work on social media, and I'm sure that my audience is going to get a lot out of this. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Obviously, we've, we've chatted a little bit in the past, but uh, first time face-to-face. -face. Right. Yeah, really good to meet you finally. Um, for anyone who's not aware of you, I mean, you've got a large following. You've been on a lot of the big, you know, plant-based uh, nutrition platforms. But for one or two people in the audience who may not know who you are, do you want to do a quick little intro about yourself and what it is that you do? Yeah, so I'm a naturopathic doctor in Vancouver, uh, Canada. I um, focus a lot on nutrition in my practice, although of course that's not all I, I uh, focus on. I, I implement a variety of modalities, including medication and everything as well. Um, and I focus a lot on cardiometabolic risk factors or improving cardiometabolic risk, um, things like cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, et cetera. And I online focus a lot on myth busting around nutrition. So there's a lot of myths obviously propagated by uh, certain communities like the carnivore keto community <laughs> but also from our own plant-based community and i try to set the record straight as best i can yeah it's important that we get our information correct isn't it because the minute you say something like one you may have said a hundred things right the minute something's wrong and people can point to that and they'll just throw out the baby with the bath water and uh yeah it's important important work that you do so really appreciate you um so recently i had the fantastic dr michael gregor on uh, i'm a massive fan of his work i've implemented just about everything he's ever said on healthy nutrition in the in the last 11 years since i've been following him with great success uh, however there was one topic that we covered which um left myself and my audience very confused and it was regarding optimal protein requirements for strength and physique athletes now, he was of the opinion that my protein intake was, to put it in his words, ridiculous. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I don't need as much to be optimal in terms of getting the most out of my training um, as a physique athlete. He cited data to back that up. Um, but from my understanding, listening to exercise scientists who hopefully are also data driven, um, you know, that's, that was at odds with what he was saying. I'm no research scientist. Um you know, I've not been formally taught how to read the research. So this is where you come in, um, Dr. Nagra, as I know you're well versed. Where, in your opinion, does the preponderance of data point currently? Um, so with protein, I think uh, particularly if we're talking about muscle and strength gains, we can get to other areas a little bit later on. But um, for muscle and strength, the overall balance of evidence suggests that around 1.5, 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight seems to be ideal for uh, both increasing fat-free mass um, as well as strength. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there are a couple papers in particular that are cited to support that. So there was a meta-regression by Morton. Uh, this was a few years back now, three, four years back, um, I believe. And in this one, they basically found that as protein intake increases, while also resistance training, of course, um, up to about 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, um, there was you know, further improvement in muscle mass or fat-free mass. Mm -hmm. However, beyond that, increasing beyond that 1.6 grams per kilogram did not seem to elicit a significant benefit. Now, subsequently, there was another uh, meta-analysis published by Tagawa and co. Uh, this was about a year and a half ago. And they looked at strength and found that around 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight is where that um, that tapering off of the effect sort of occurs. So um, going from, say, 0 0.8 grams per kilogram, which is uh, the RDA, that's what's typically recommended, at least to support you know good health, mm -hmm. Um, going from that up to about uh, one and a half grams per kilogram, so almost double, um, led to about a you know roughly eight percent um, further gains in strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big takeaway here, though, is that that's specifically when combined with resistance training. So if you looked at those who were increasing protein intake but not training, there was little to no gain in strength. Um, obviously, you need to actually use the muscles and stress the muscles in order to to improve yeah. strength. Um, but when you actually, you know, when you do both, we do see an impact of protein is the impact of protein earth shattering. Are you like tripling your strength? No. Um, but over several years that roughly, you know, eight ish percent, um, additional gain can add up. 
And so that's something to, to really consider. And, and we even, even saw significant benefits in those over age 60 in this, um, in this right. meta-analysis. So also in those older populations. It's never too late. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this recommendation, is that on total or lean body weight? That's total weight. Total body yeah. weight. Yeah. Yeah. So with lean weight, it would be higher. I've seen different estimates. I'm not sure exactly which one would be the best. So I tend to go with the um, total body weight uh, estimate. Um, obviously, there would be exceptions in, in cases of like obesity, for example, you, you might focus more on the lean mass, but yeah. um, but generally speaking, going for total mass uh, works just fine. I heard that um, optimal protein per body weight actually becomes, the, the requirement for protein becomes more during a cutting phase. Do, do you know anything around the science for that, like why that happens to be? Yeah, so that is the case. While you're in a caloric deficit, you have to use up some of your mass, whether that's uh, fat mass or muscle mass, generally you're going to use a bit of both. However, if you're resistance training and you jack up the protein intake, um, usually beyond about two grams per kilogram, some estimates place it even higher, wow. um, then you can help mitigate some of that, that muscle loss. Um, of course, it also depends on how big the caloric deficit is. If you're in a a deficit of a few hundred calories, that's going to be different than if you're in a deficit of like 800 calories, um, as far as how much muscle mass you'd be losing. But uh, help, resistance training is going to be number one there for helping maintain. And then the additional protein on top of that is beneficial. And mm -hmm. actually going back to the focus on resistance training, I, I just want to point out that that is number one, even for muscle gains. Um, yeah. A lot of people, um, I think oversell the impact of protein, uh, but then we have others saying that there's no benefit to protein. So um, it, the truth is somewhere in the middle, uh, yes. generally with, with regard to protein, but the resistance training aspect is key. Okay, interesting. How much um, do you know, would you happen to know this, how much of a deficit is healthy? Like, can we lose maybe 1% of our total body weight each week and maintain a good muscle mass? Have you heard any science on this? So that's actually an area I'd have to look at a bit more. There's a couple, um, couple researchers in that area who I can ask, but, uh, but you know, generally anywhere from like three, five, four or 500 calories tends to be, um, what is done, how, how much, or how evidence-based that is. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. can you go further with, while still maintaining muscle mass? I'm not sure. That's something I'd have to look at a bit more. Interesting. From, from what my understanding from the sort of exercise scientists I follow, they tend to say like no more than 1% of total body weight. So I guess, you know, if you're morbidly obese, you may be able to do like 3x that upper mm -hmm. recommendation. And they, and they say that that should help you to ha hold on to your muscle mass. However, as you get super lean onto like contest ready, mm -hmm. maybe you need to bring that down like maybe half a pound a week because at that stage, like it, it's hard. I don't know why anyone does it. I had to go. It was, <laughs> it was miserable, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear your uh, perspective on that. If you do happen to find out. Yeah. I was just wondering how, cause obviously Dr. Gregor is super evidence-based uh, as are you. And we're all just trying to find out the truth. I think there's a very nice lack of ego here, which is really good. How do you think the discrepancy may have occurred? Do you think the studies he was looking at, perhaps they're not looking at serious athletes or because he's in the more of the health sphere rather than the optimal muscle gain sphere, is he just looking at studies that are, you know, maybe they're just skewed in, you know, but because of their kind of what they're looking for, what's your perspective on that? Yeah. I mean, it's something that I can maybe chat with him next time I, I see him, but uh, so it's my understanding that there's a couple papers in particular that are cited, um, if not directly by him, at least people he's interviewed. And I've seen these ones floating around. So I, I'm making a bit of an assumption here that, that sure. this is what he would, he would base it on. Um, but there were a couple meta analyses where they did not detect significant benefits for um, muscle or strength outcomes in older adults who are supplementing additional protein in mm -hmm. particular. Um, even in the interview with you, he seemed to suggest that there was at least a small benefit in the younger populations, but not yeah. so much in the older population. And so um, if we look at the individual trials that were included in these meta-analyses, that's ultimately what you have to do. The meta-analysis of the studies is only as good as the studies that it includes. Um, we see that the results are actually compatible with there being a benefit. Um, they just weren't statistically significant. So we can't say that there was necessarily no benefit. We also can't say confidently that there was a benefit. It's just, um, it's unclear. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the low protein group uh, in most leaf trials was already getting more than the RDA. 
um, significantly more than the RDA in a lot of cases. Right. And so it might be the case that the benefits start to taper off at those higher levels of intake. So if you're including sort of a modestly high versus an even higher intake, um, you might not see much benefit, especially in a short-term trial that's typically around a couple months or so. Mm -hmm. um, now, there was one of the meta-analyses where they did a subgroup analysis and uh, specifically looking at those ages 65 and up. And they found that those getting about 1.2 to close to 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight did see a small but statistically significant benefit in uh, lean mass. So there is some evidence pointing that direction, but really there's only one trial trial I'm aware of where the low intake group was 0 0.8 grams per kilogram and the high intake group was 1.6 grams per kilogram in older adults specifically. So this was like double the intake. Um, and in that paper, the older adults did see about double the, the improvements in um, the mass and then uh, even greater strength improvements as well. So we are seeing a benefit when the low intake is truly that lower cutoff and then the higher intake is substantially higher, leading to a, a wide gap in intakes. Um, and mm -hmm. so this could indicate benefit. Now, there are some limitations to that study. They didn't use the gold standard as far as um, measuring lean mass. And, and mm -hmm. so um, there are some questions and I'd like to see similar studies repeated, perhaps in different populations um, using different methods uh, so we can have more confidence in those findings but we are seeing generally speaking that higher intakes do actually lead to benefit um, in those older populations as well based on some of the studies that are maybe best equipped to answer that question yeah interesting um and then the other side of the coin something that i've you know, worried about in the past. A common theme among some lo longevity experts is that um, is one of protein restriction and, and mm -hmm. especially the amino acid methionine um, for the prevention of cancer. Um, I've heard some scientists, even plant-based ones, disagreeing with the notion that it's proven in humans. Um, according to them, we only have um, studies in kind of small animals, which, you know, we're not mice, like that doesn't necessarily bear out and it's kind of all over the place. Or, you know, there's zero studies in primates and carnivore diet is yep we're not lions you heard it here first we are actually primates so don't start um, <laughs> um so oh when they go on to say that observational studies even the observational studies in humans don't seem to show um, an elevated cancer risk with higher protein diets. What's, what's your perspective on all, all of that please? Yeah and I, I think that's actually a, a good um segue here because a lot of the you know a lot of the concerns around protein do stem from as you said like animal studies and um some like in, in vitro petri dish sort of studies are looking at specific mechanisms and when it comes to animal studies the the translation to humans is all over the place mm -hmm. um depending on what sort of area we're like area of science we're looking at and so we can't predictably say that because something happens in like a rodent that it's going to happen in a human um at the same time when we look at isolated mechanisms or speculate about isolated mechanisms the translation of that to like clinically relevant human outcomes is you know single digit percentages it's, it's very low and so mm -hmm. what we have to do is look at actual long-term human data, those eating more protein versus those eating less, and what ultimately happens you know, several years down the road. And the um, largest meta-analysis of prospective cohorts that's been done, and this was by Nagishi um, and in 2020, I believe was the year, uh, there's 31 cohorts included in the meta-analysis, and they found that those eating the most total protein had a 6% lower risk of total mortality. So that would be the risk of dying during the given studies. Um, well, lower risk. That, that period of follow-up. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. But when you break it down into animal and protein, or plant protein, we see that higher plant protein intake was associated with an 8% lower risk of mortality, but animal protein was not significantly associated with risk. And so this suggests that a lot of that benefit is probably driven more so by plant protein and not so much by animal protein. Mm -hmm. And in fact, each additional 3% of calories from plant protein was associated with a 5% lower risk. That's not even a large increase wow. in plant protein intake. It's pretty modest. That's amazing. Um, and one thing that they did, uh, and this is often the finding I, I cite the most, is when they uh, confined the analysis to just the studies that considered the overall macronutrient intake and essentially what the protein would be replacing. Is it replacing mm -hmm. fats or carbs or, or what have you? Um, you see that plant protein was still statistically significant uh, and the result hardly changed. Whereas with total protein, it was no longer statistically significant. So that suggests that um, 
in the case of total protein and perhaps some of the animal protein, it was just replacing things that may have been worse um, yeah. versus um, with the plant protein, even when you do, I'm not going to say it's perfect, but fairly well to adjust for those factors, um, the plant protein is still beneficial and that's with higher intakes versus lower. So I, I don't see the argument for the exact opposite being true. I think that's the mm -hmm. big takeaway is it's not like um, those claiming that higher protein is is harmful are just saying that, oh, these results are incorrect, but they're saying they're incorrect and it's the opposite is actually yeah. true. Um, yeah. And so that's that's where I start to really question it. Um, and it, I mean, th this goes into a lot of different topics uh, that we see in the nutrition space. We have from both the carnivore and the plant-based space. I mean, we see a lot of stuff around oils being harmful because of impairments of flow mediated dilation or uh, what have you. But when you look at long-term follow-ups, olive oil, other vegetable oils are actually beneficial for cardiovascular risk, total mortality, even when replacing whole food fat sources like avocado, um, as was seen in the nurses health and health professionals follow-up studies. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's uh, it's just we need to take a step back and look at actual hard health outcomes long, over the long term versus honing in on these you know isolated mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was sort of cancer risk um, covered. Well, that was it, total mortality, but but so yeah, it, previously we answered the yeah. the yeah, cancer. Yeah. Now we're talking total mortality. What about kidney disease? I hear that in China. Now that they're more affluent, they you know they're buying more animal products, therefore their protein's going up. And now they're getting a lot of kidney disease. I hear it's the fastest growing disease. I don't know how true that is. Um, is there any risk to plant based based eaters with that particular disease? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm not sure about the stat with it being fastest growing. Um, I mean, it could be true. Um, but with with protein intake and kidney disease. So there, there's a couple ways that we can look at that. For one, we have randomized controlled trials um, actually measuring markers of kidney function and filtration rate um, when supplementing protein, oftentimes from actual protein supplements, sometimes from high protein food sources. And we see that in healthy individuals, so people without kidney disease or kidney impairment um, at the beginning, we don't see further impairment um, in kidney function. Right. And so it seems to actually be safe from that perspective. However, um, in people with kidney disease, I mean, obviously this is something you would speak with your doctor with, um, depending on you know what severity of the kidney disease and, and background diet, you may need to make modifications. Um, but uh, obviously I can't speak to everyone here, so um, talk with your doctor about that one. <laughs> but uh, uh, with regard to um, chronic kidney disease incidence, so actually developing the disease, we see that in some studies anyway, animal protein, particularly animal protein from like red meat and processed meats is associated with a higher risk of developing chronic kidney disease, whereas plant protein sources tend to be associated with a lower risk. And wow. uh, this may in part be due to the high potassium content, perhaps some of the polyphenols in the plant foods. And with the animal foods, especially processed meats, it could be the sodium, it could be the you know saturated fat, perhaps it, there could be a few things uh, contributing negatively there. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, so what I take from that, Dr. Nagra, in your view, I should be okay as a 200 pound uh, <laughs> vegan um, physique athlete eating 200 grams of protein per day, predominantly whole plant foods, a couple of protein powders, which obviously isn't as health promoting as the whole plant foods. I'll be the first one to admit that. And I'd be the first one to drop those out if I stopped being a bodybuilder. But in your view, you think that I don't particularly have anything to, to really worry about? No, I, I don't see any good evidence for, for that being harmful. And even with protein powders, I mean, we have multiple clinical trials suggesting that it improves certain lipid parameters like LDL cholesterol and may help improve blood sugar management. I mean, there are potential benefits there too. So mm. even if we were to hypothetically say that there was some mechanism by which it could be negative, there are other mechanisms by which it could be positive. So we have to go back to what is the net result? What is the net outcome? Um, and I, I guess a last point that I would make is that um, it's not just about muscle gains. It's not even just about mortality risk, but there are other things like perhaps bone health, higher protein intake is associated with a lower risk of hip fractures. We have randomized controlled trials suggesting that higher protein intake might help prevent bone mineral density loss. Um, there are other reasons that we might want to consider higher protein intakes too. I'm not saying everyone needs to get 1.6 grams per kilogram. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, if you're looking to absolutely maximize muscle and strength gains, sure. Um, but I do think that there's a good argument that can be made for going 
going north of that RDA to maybe around 1.1, 1.2 grams per kilogram. And in fact, oh. in some European countries, that's actually the recommendation uh, for wow, older adults in particular. That. Yeah, the ability to digest and absorb protein and utilize protein actually declines with age. And so some countries have actually put in recommendations that are a bit higher as, as you get over uh, roughly around like 60, 65 or so. Yeah, fascinating. That's brilliant. Well, you've answered all my questions I had relative to my chat with Dr. Gregor, but I find this topic so fascinating and you're so well versed. Is there anything uh, relative to all this that we haven't touched on that you think is, is worthwhile mentioning? Um, no, I mean, I, I think we've we've covered a lot of it. I mean, if there was one thing that I was going to add, it would probably be around um, just the benefit of swapping even small amounts or modest amounts of animal protein for plant protein. So if we look at substitution analyses, um, which are generally these longer term cohort studies where you look at replacement of even 3% of, of calories from animal protein with plant protein sources, you see pretty substantial reductions in the risk of total mortality, cardiovascular disease, sometimes cancer mortality, depending on what the animal protein source is. Right. Um, and like, if you're looking at 3% of calories from protein, that's less than a serving of red meat typically yeah. um, for, for most people. And so um, these are pretty small shifts that can lead to measurable uh, benefits down the road. Yeah. And so um, it's not necessarily about being perfect either, but starting to, to move that yeah, direction can have a positive value. impact. So any bodybuilders watching, you know, I was terrified when I went plant-based and, um, but it was nothing but a benefit to my training in terms of energy recovery. Um, and again, just as well. So yeah, swap a little bit out like Dr. Nagra says, see how you go. If you're fine, swap out a little bit more and you can be big and ripped and not, not that you don't need to be the biggest, most ripped corpse in the cemetery. You can actually be alive and enjoying your physique as well. And I think that's got to be better, hasn't it? You know? Uh, Dr. Nagra, thank you so much. Uh, now, obviously, you're, you've got a big following on um, Instagram. You're uh, D, dr.matthewnagra, or one word. Is there anywhere else if people want to find out more about you, anywhere else they can go? Yeah, I'm on uh, basically all the social media platforms at this point, basically the, the same name, and I, I often cross post, so you might, might see duplicates. Um, and then I also have a website, drmatthewnagra.com, where I post... Um, things like this, you know, podcasts or videos that I, I've been on. And so you'll see a link for this there uh, once it's up um, and uh, any longer form articles that I write uh, or um, uh, sometimes I aggregate my Instagram posts. If I have multiple on a single topic, I'll aggregate them into an article and um, you can kind of have it in, in one place like that too. So uh, you can check out more information there. Fantastic. I'll post a link below so people can find you. Um, Thank you so much for what you do. You're an absolute legend. And just for people like me who love nutrition and science, you're just such a font of knowledge. And I really appreciate everything you do, brother. Thank you. No, thanks for having me on. Hopefully we can uh, do this again. I hope so. I hope so.